Welcome to Mayo Clinic's ECG segment, Making Waves, continuing medical education podcast. Join us for a lively discussion on the latest and greatest in the field of electrocardiography. We'll discuss some of the exciting and innovative work happening at Mayo Clinic and beyond with the most brilliant minds in the space and provide valuable insights that can be directly applied to your practice. Welcome to Mayo Clinic's ECG segment, Making Waves. In this episode, we dive into the promising treatment strategy of cardioneuroablation for atrial fibrillation. If you haven't listened to our basal bagel one, it was really exciting and you'll learn all about that. Now joining us back today is a cardiac electrophysiologist. He's been not with us in the past and he has a unique experience in working with these patients. Today, we're gonna to discover how bagel tone, high bagel tone contributes to atrial fibrillation how to identify the subset patients that might benefit from cardioneuroablation and explore what the future of atrial fib ablation has in store. And so let's introduce our guest that you guys know well, Dr. Guru Kolgi, an assistant professor of medicine at the Mayo Clinic, Rochester, Minnesota campus. He completed his medical education at Mulana Azad Medical College in Delhi University in India. And then he came here to the United States, and we're so glad we've kept him here. He finished his internal medicine training at the University of Connecticut, cardiology fellowship at Virginia Commonwealth University, and then came here to Mayo Clinic in Rochester to complete his cardiac electrophysiology fellowship, and then recruited to stay here on staff where he was a Mayo Clinic scholar. He also recently completed a master's of science program in artificial intelligence in healthcare. Dr. Colby has authored well over 80 peer-reviewed manuscripts, he has research interests spanning from cardioneuroablation, which we'll talk about today, to the cardiac applications of artificial intelligence. He actively participates in the medical community, serving on committees and editorial boards, and he's earned several awards for his clinical and academic achievements. You can also find him actively engaging on social media, where he has his handle at the Rhythm Doc. So make sure you go and follow him. Thank you, Dr. Colby, for joining us again. Thank you so much, Dr. Cashew. Love being here. Well. Welcome back. You know, we talked about uh, vasovagal syncope and how it related to cardioneuroablation, but this field is growing. And, you know, let's start off by looking at, you know, first atrial fibrillation, but really how does high vagal tone actually contribute to it? Yes, thank you. That's a very important question. And, you know, when people think of atrial fibrillation, what comes to mind is a patient who has a regular heart rate with the heart rate being very fast, so oftentimes it's you know over 100 beats a minute, 120, 140, 150. And you know, because it's more tachycardia-mediated symptoms for the most part, uh, most of us feel that the arm of the autonomic nervous system that causes it is the sympathetic nervous system. So as, as we know, we have the sympathetic system, which is our fight-or-flight response, causes the heart rate and blood pressure to go up. And the parasympathetic system that is mediated by the vagus nerve is what causes the heart rate and blood pressure to go down. So it is counterintuitive to think how can the vagus nerve ca cause atrial fibrillation. And there's a reason why that happens. is because AFib, especially in the paroxysmal kind, which is the, the kind of patient who gets off and on AFib, is a disease of triggers. So these triggers are oftentimes present in the pulmonary veins. Now those are the veins that bring blood from the lungs to the heart and carry these uh, muscle sleeves that cause uh, AFib to happen. Now, in order for AFib triggers to cause AFib, the atrium should have contracted and relaxed and then be ready for this extra beat that comes in. So, you know, if the atrium is still contracting or the action potential is long, it is less likely for a, a trigger to cause atrial fibrillation. But what happens with vagus stimulation is yes, it brings the heart rate and blood pressure down, but it also importantly shortens the atrial refractory period. So it kind of makes that action potential happen quickly. So then the atrium is ready for another beat to happen. So even though the heart rate is slower, uh, a trigger is more likely to cause atrial fibrillation in the presence of vagal stimulation. So because of that fact, we've seen patients who are, you know, paradoxically healthy patients, athletes, or patients who are younger, uh, get AFib uh, in the middle of the night when the vagal tone is high, or sometimes you'll have patients reporting atrial fibrillation after they take a big meal or eat a big meal or have carbonated beverages. So this is because the esophagus is in close proximity to the vagus nerve and in the stretch of the esophagus can cause vagal stimulation. And, and younger patients or athletes specifically have a high vagal tone as well. So they oftentimes come to us saying, hey, I'm doing everything right, I'm exercising, 
exercising, I'm healthy, uh, weight's normal, yet uh, I have AFib. So for these uh, patients, we feel the vagal tone uh, is a sim- significant uh, cause of atrial fibrillation. I, I mean, as you mentioned, you usually, you can see the sympathetic, but it, it's almost like a, a paradox. But I think the way you, uh, you said that can, makes complete sense. Now, what subset of patients with atrial fibrillation can you know, benefit from this new cardioneuroablation? Yeah. So, so in theory, I mean, really all patients, if we can get rid of the vagus tone, uh, what happens is the atrial action potential or atrial effective refractory period lengthens. And this is something that's been studied extensively in animals and humans. So in theory, all patients should benefit from it because it would make them less likely uh, to get AFib with these triggers. But in particular, Patients who have these uh, features that I mentioned, so you, uh, they're younger, they're otherwise healthy, and they have these vagal triggers where they say, uh, Doc, it happens in the middle of the night always, I wake up with AFib, or it happens uh, after a big meal or something like that. Uh, those patients are, are particularly uh, those that will benefit from a vagal denervation in addition to what we do normally with the pulmonary vein isolation for AFib ablations. Okay, so you would also do the uh, the PBI as well. Okay, that's that's interesting. Yeah, it makes sense. And I'll so maybe mention a I mentioned yeah. a study. Sorry uh, for why you know that's known because about a decade ago, people have looked at patients who just get PBI, pulmonary vein isolation versus pulmonary vein isolation and ganglia ablation, and it seems to have an additive benefit to just uh, pulmonary vein isolation or ganglia ablation alone. In terms of the, the whole cardioneuro ablation, uh, because admittedly, you know, it's been new to me ever since, you know, we began, you know, talking about this, uh, but what's been done in the field? And, and honestly, where do you see the future of AFib ablation and the management uh, going with this potential option? Yeah. So uh, the field has been there for a while and autonomics uh, has been studied for the last, you know, three or four decades or longer in arrhythmias. But the field of cardioneural ablation, you know, probably began for the first time in Brazil in the late 90s, early 2000s, uh, soon after AFib ablation came about. So, uh, and that was more in the population subset of patients with basovagal syncope, as we discussed those uh, treatment strategies in a separate podcast. But as they started studying it more, they realized that a high vagal tone causes these changes in the atrial refractory period. So then the thought came, like, why not add this to patients with the, who are already getting an AFib ablation? And in the last decade or so, uh, a lot of good work has been done in the field, both in uh, the electrophysiology field with catheter ablation, as well as a surgical ablation field, where you know, surgeons, when they're doing a maze procedure for atrial fibrillation, can, uh, can cause ganglia, can create ganglia ablation and take them out of the equation and then create vagal denervation that way. So all of these studies have consistently shown benefit of vagal denervation in addition to pulmonary vein isolation. To the point where we feel that a standard pulmonary vein isolation, when we go around the veins, causing um, uh, electrical isolation of the veins, we probably cause some degree of vagal denervation concomitantly without even realizing it. And that is what is in the benefit of um, uh, the pulmonary vein isolation for these patients. But the idea is to do it more, um, uh, you know, uh, to plan on doing it and test it before and after. Uh, Mm -hmm. So if we can test the vagal tone at baseline, do the ablation and test it after and make sure that it is completely denervated, then there's uh, some uh, studies to suggest that that's a better way of doing AFib ablations. Wow. Well, thank you. In today's discussion, we explored this promising treatment strategy of cardioneuroablation for atrial fibrillation. Dr. Kolge taught us and shared his invaluable insights into how high vagal tone actually contributes to atrial fibrillation, which was somewhat of a paradox to me. The patients who can benefit from this cardioneuroablation and what the future of the field holds. Now, we did do a podcast on basal vagal uh, syncope and how cardioneuroablation can be used for that. So make sure to go back and listen to that one. That was quite fascinating and something we deal with. Now, Dr. Kogi, we always appreciate you joining us and thank you so much for coming on again. We hope you'll join us again and share us what this field, this growing field that you know, you're leading uh, for us has to, has to come. So thank you again uh, for all your time and your efforts in this field. Thank you so much for having me. Always a pleasure. Thank you for joining us today. We invite you to share your thoughts and suggestions about the podcast at cveducation.mayo.edu. Be sure to subscribe to a Mayo Clinic cardiovascular CME podcast on your favorite platform. 
and tune in every other week to explore today's most pressing electrocardiography topics with your colleagues at Mayo Clinic. This has been a Mayo Clinic podcast.